Good afternoon, happy Thursday evening, going into the Friday, going into the long weekend. Hope you're doing well. Another busy day for me, like I uh, have said in the past, Wednesdays and Thursdays tend to be my busiest. Um, got a wee bit more work uh, to do, maybe another 20 minutes or so, um, once I have cocktail in hand. But hope you all are doing well. First order of business is an update on my uh, steak last night. I made it at, uh, I was trying a 136 degrees sous vide steak for my ribeye. And it was great, it was really good. Um, I'm not convinced yet that 136 is better than 134.5. Um, and it's always, you know, I really wanna do like a, a controlled experiment because you never know if the cut of the meat is a little bit different or uh, maybe it needed some a little bit more time. Uh, at the 136, so I don't know. So I might try one more at 136 before going back to 134.5. Uh, either way, it's delicious, cooked evenly all the way through, um, nice and tender, and uh, had a nice sear on the cast iron pan afterwards. Um, we're hoping to, you know, when I, I get my cast iron on the highest flame I can get it, um, and let it go for like five minutes, so it's super, super hot. Um, and I like uh, temp gun it and I, maybe at like 550, 575 on the pan. And then what I've learned is instead of putting the oil in the pan, which requires you to use more oil than you need and, and gets a lot of splattering, what I've learned to do is to brush the steak directly with the oil. I use avocado oil because it has a really high um, burned smoke, smoke point, burn temperature, smoke point, smoke point. Um, and that way you don't get as much messy splatter, although it still gets super, super smoky. And so we want to get in uh, like a good uh, ventilation fan over our stove. Right now we don't have anything. We used to have like the microwave over here that just has like a, it, you can put the fan on and it had like a filter, I guess, that it can go through, which is common, but it didn't actually vent it out of the house. But we want to just cut through the wall eventually and uh, put in a nice high high suckage vacuum fan that can uh, help with that. So otherwise the, the house smells like steak, which is good, but it gets super, super smoky. So anyway, that's my report on the steak. Um, we uh, just, and maybe yesterday, started our next puzzle. Um, this puzzle we're doing, Helen recently got, it's a thousand piece puzzle that uh, it's titled Arboretum. And Helen's really into these different, the puzzles that have like the, like scientific illustrations. And so this is all of different trees. There's like, you know, 15 or 20 different trees. And then at the bottom, there's like text, which like number one, it says what kind of tree it is, that sort of thing. And so we uh, got, we're done with the border on that and have done a sort of day two of sorting on that puzzle. And so far it is good fun. Um, so that is going pretty, pretty well. Um, and yeah, not much, not much else going on work-wise. Um, I've been uh, doing some curriculum work for eighth grade math, and we've been, it's been all about exponents and exponential functions. Um, and I haven't yet, and what we decided today is that for the last lesson of the year, we're going to um, make it COVID related, because it seems like, uh, like a crime to not at all mention this huge event that's going on, the most, you know, the biggest, most disruptive event in any of our lives that is a uh, textbook example of an exponential function and to be teaching kids about exponential functions and not make that connection is uh, criminal and so we're trying to figure out exactly what angle to take and how to do it tactfully obviously um, but I think that'll be the the final lesson of the year that I'll get working on next week but started doing some brainstorming on that today which was fun um, and then in the news, I saw uh, Facebook today announced that they're going to allow a bunch of their employees to just permanently work from home, and they're sort of rethinking overall their like offices and work structures. And so I'm, uh, I was talking with Helen about that, because I'm curious whether this is going to be just a bigger move for a lot more people get to work from home from now on, because, you know, at least in a lot of industries, it works, and it works well. And, you know, even if it's not work from home every day, maybe it's three days a week or two days a week or even one day a week, um, which I think will improve a lot of people's quality of life and also is good for the environment because you have people commuting less. So I am pro that. All right, but 
All of this uh, is, is building up to our main event for today. I'm super excited. We are making the, the famous, uh, iconic, historic Ramos Gin Fizz. Now this is the drink that if you ordered at a busy bar, the bartender is going to hate you <laughs> because it is uh, involved and it takes a long time to make and takes a lot of physical labor in terms of shaking to get it ready to go. Um, but that said, we are uh, going to make it here the luxury of our own home. Um, and this is, uh, some people also call this the New Orleans Fizz. It is a New Orleans drink. Um, it basically goes back to, you know, why is it called the Ramos Gin Fizz? Well, there's a man, Henry Charles Ramos, who went by the name Carl. Carl Ramos in uh, 1888. Um, took over ownership of this bar called the Imperial Cabinet in New Orleans. And, uh, you know, when he first took it over, it was like pretty busy, um, nothing, you know, not, not, nothing crazy. But then what happened in the 1890s, I don't know if you know this, but in the 1890s, New Orleans started to take off as a big tourist destination. So it got busier and busier and busier, and he found his bar getting busier and busier and busier. And so the, the two factors that really led to his success is like one, these external factors of people coming to New Orleans and, you know, looking to drink. Uh, and at the time, actually in the north and um, in other parts of the country, some of them were starting to experiment a little bit with temperance and, and dryness and banning alcohol and, you know, small sex. And so I think a lot of it was people coming down and looking to drink in New Orleans. But anyway, this influx of all these tourists. But also, um, he has, he makes this great drink. It's an amazing drink called the Ramos Gin Fizz. Um, and the thing about the Ramos Gin Fizz is that it um, requires a lot of physical labor in order to shake it all up. Because it has what you would normally have for like a sour, um, which is gin and then citrus. Uh, historically, he would use both lemon and lime juice. That's what we'll be using today. But also, um, it has, so already you're shaking it, right? You're shaking it if you have the, the citrus in there. Um, but he also had some egg white, and he also had heavy cream. And he had to shake all of these things together. Now already, if you just have egg white, you need to shake it a ton. Or if you just have the heavy cream, you have to shake it a ton. And indeed, there were drinks in the era that had one or the other of these. But this was the first one to really bring it all together. And you get this amazing, if done right, this amazing, light, fluffy, frothy, fizzy cocktail. So really excited um, about that. And so uh, this, in fact, <laughs> used so much labor that uh, at his bar, he each bartender, and he was making so many of these, you know, he, he became known as, this is the you know, most famous gin fizz saloon in the world, the Kansas City Star in the 1890s reported. So everybody was coming and everybody was ordering this drink, uh, what he called his one and only, the Ramos Gin Fizz. And so since they were turning out so many of these, each bartender had their own second back bar person um, typically like a young black man. <laughs> and basically the bartender would put everything together, give it to the shaker boy, as they called him, and he, his job was literally just to do all the shaking. And there were times, you know, when, when Mardi Gras was already a thing down there and people were going down, you'd have six bartenders and then six shaker boys. And then as you progress forward, even in, uh, there's, there's stories about in 1915 Mardi Gras, um, at this point he had taken over, he'd moved to another bar still in New Orleans called the Stag Saloon. And there, there's stories of having 15 of these shaker boys lined up uh, and they changed their style a little bit where, uh, you know, they would make the drink and put it in the shaker and hand it to the first one in line. And he'd go until he got tired and hand it to the next one and would go all the way down the line there. The point is you need to shake this drink a lot. Shake, shake, and shake some more. And uh, con contemporaneous uh, accounts say that they shook it for 15 minutes, which I don't know if I believe that it was actually 15 minutes. I'm sure it felt that long, um, but uh, we won't be shaking for 15 minutes, but we will be shaking for plenty of time um, tonight. Uh, and am really excited to do it. The other thing that's nice about this recipe is not only do we know exactly where it was invented, who invented it, um, became a super famous drink, but we know the exact recipe. So there are you know, a lot of farmen then and since then that have 
really you know held their their secret recipes close to the vest well carl ramos gave us the gift of sharing the exact recipe of how to make it um in uh in many different um forums um but especially you know later in life once he died in, in the middle of prohibition so early on in prohibition he's like we're not making drinks anymore guys we know you're making drinks at home here's how you make it and he laid it all out um, so we're able to make a, a delicious drink. And so the other thing about this is, um, do you have Helen on hand to help shake? Ha! I know, she's upstairs too, and we just had a little bit of puzzle time and she's back at work, but I might call her in for reinforcements. Um, but I've been resting my arms all day, so I am ready to go. All right. Um, the other thing is that we want this to be sort of like a, a nice, pretty, beautiful, foamy drink at the top, and so I'm going to be trying a technique that I uh, haven't done before in terms of pouring it, where there is a little bit of seltzer. So we're going to start with the seltzer in the bottom after we're done with the shaking, and then we're going to um, pour it on top of the seltzer, let it fizz up, let it sit for a couple of minutes so that all the liquid sort of strains from the foam, and then we're going to finish the pour on top to see if we can get a nice sort of domed top of top. So this is gonna be sort of involved and, um, but I'm sure a short tasty drink. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make my seltzer water. So here I just have some cold water and I'm gonna grab my soda stream and I'm gonna get this nice and fizzy um, and charge it right up. So let's get going on that. do it the kind of busier it gets and it's um right so that should be good we'll come back to you in a little bit all right Um, great, so that is taken care of. I'm just gonna grab my ice now also. And let's get to work. So in my glass here, I am going to pour two ounces of gin. This wouldn't be a gin fizz without the gin. Um, now I'm going to take three quarters of an ounce of heavy cream. I'm going to take three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup. I'm going to take half an ounce of lime juice. Perfect. Half an ounce of lemon juice. It's like a little short. Very nice, very nice. Um, five drops of orange flower water. Just classic for this drink. Basically the only thing we use it for. <laughs> um, and then an egg white. Let's just separate our egg.
right, so we've got a lot of liquid in here. Um, perfect. So now I'm going to take, now this, here's the, um, the technique that is uh, put forth by um, Jim Meehan in my Meehan's Bartender Guide, which is to take just two cubes. Actually, wait, dry shake. Oh, we're going to start with a dry shake. Excuse me. Then we'll add the ice. So remember, dry shake is a technique in order to start to get it without worrying about the, right now we're not worried about chilling or dilution. We're just starting to whip up the ingredients. So let's get started. Sometimes I do the reverse dry shake, which is you shake with ice, then you strain out the ice, and then you shake, what's, uh, you shake without the ice. Second, but now we're doing the normal dry shake, which is to shake without the ice first, and then we'll add the ice. What's interesting though, is that they're gonna have us add two cubes of ice and basically um, shake totally with these, since we have two very like precisely measured ice cubes, we're just gonna shake until the ice cubes are gone. They're totally disintegrated slash melted into the drink. And we know that's the perfect amount of dilution and chilling because we know exactly how big the ice cubes are, which is nice. Oh. You can kind of change uh, position every once in a while to work slightly different muscles. All right, Whew. so that's probably a good 90 seconds or so to get us started. Now I'm gonna add my two one and a quarter inch ice cubes. And we're gonna keep shaking until the ice cubes are gone. is uh, starting to at least be a little bit quieter. Glad Liam is enjoying all of the shaking, Megan. <laughs> they sound smaller. Almost there. workout for today. Ooh, and I think we're there. Whoo, I'm tired just watching all the shaking. You and me both, Olivia. You and me both. So, I've got my chilled Collins glass. Had that in the freezer for a while. And then I threw some ice cubes in there as I've been here shaking. Now I'm gonna add an ounce and a half of our club soda. Now I'm gonna pour unstrained on top of the club soda, like so. You see I'm getting that beautiful foaming coming up. 
I'm going to stop it right now when it gets to the rim. And I'm going to give it a couple minutes just to let it settle. I have a little bit more liquid in here that I'm going to add at the very end. So you can see it's starting to kind of slowly settle. This might take a minute or two. It gives me time to catch my breath a little bit. Quinn just asked, why does he shake so long when I called him over? Ha ha! In this case, Quinn, it's because it takes a long time to whip up the egg whites and the heavy cream to get them nice and fluffy. All right, beautiful, foamy. Right now I feel like it's starting to set. All the foam goes to about here. Give it a little bit more time. While we do that, I'm gonna throw my heavy cream and my ice back in my fridge and my freezer so that stays fresh and cold. On the docket tonight, we're making a teriyaki salmon, which is exciting. We have this recipe that we've been making about once a week for the last couple of months, where you, um, you marinate the salmon in some uh, like rice vinegar, mirin, and soy sauce, and then you make a teriyaki sauce, and then you pan fry the salmon uh, in the sauce, and then you let the sauce you know, cook down and get super, uh, super tasty and concentrated, and um, thick and viscous and then pour it on top with a little bit of rice um, and it's all set. So this is hilarious. I just got a little buzz on my watch and it says workout. It looks like you're working out <laughs> and I can record an indoor run, record an outdoor run or change my workout. Let me go change workout and I don't know. I don't see. I'm flipping through the options. Elliptical, rower, stair stepper, pool swim. But I don't see um, cocktail shaking on my watch here as one of the fitness options. I don't know what's going on. Oh well, I guess I'll just ignore it for now. But I guess I earned some exercise minutes with that. <laughs> All right, so we're starting to get a little bit more separation here with our foam. Shake weight, for real. Um, so now I'm gonna, what I'm hoping is gonna happen is I'm gonna pour a little bit more volume here. I have probably like another half an ounce only. And I'm just gonna pour it gently in the center and hope that the foam rises a little bit above the rim of the glass, just like that. And then I'm gonna take cold metal straw and put it right in the side there. And here we have the legendary, the historic, the classic Ramos Gin Fizz. Look at that. Cheers. Mmm. Mmm-hmm. Creamy. Um... It's tart from the citrus um, and just has a great sort of creamy mouth feel to it. Kind of reminds me a little bit of an egg cream. Um, obviously an egg cream doesn't actually have eggs usually, but uh, just as like a, as a uh, fizzy milky drink, you know, um, with the heavy cream in there and the seltzer, gives me a little bit of that, like a tart egg cream. got two ounces of gin, but I don't really taste the gin coming through um, at all. Let me sip some of this foam. Ah, get that nice on my beard. Mmm, all right. Beautiful. I was going to say egg cream. Love it. Love a good egg cream. Love a good egg cream. All right, well, thanks for seeing me sweat a little bit and get my indoor shake weight workout for today. Um, we made the iconic 
Ramos Gin Fizz. Really excited to make this, make it the right way. I think it came out beautiful. Tastes great, uh, is super refreshing. And um, again, uh, ordering this at a busy bar and having the bartender spend five minutes shaking this drink uh, is not a nice thing, but as something to make from the comfort of your own home and to work out your own. I feel like mostly my buys and a little bit of my tries in there feeling pretty, pretty good. People in Massachusetts don't know what an egg cream is. Yeah, that could be Ben Levesque. Born and raised in Massachusetts. Ben, do you know what an egg cream is, and if so, how? Let's do a little test of this. Ben, uh, ben has lived some other places aside from Massachusetts, uh, including West Virginia. But I'm not sure the West Virginians know what an egg cream is, but... I think, too, at this point, popular culture is uh, pervasive enough where regional things can... Uh, get a reputation that is beyond just the region that we have there. Ben says, I absolutely know what an egg cream is. I'm a huge fan of old soda jerk. There you go. So people in Massachusetts, it turns out, do know what an egg cream is. Um, I have in one of my cocktail books somewhere um, some recipes for phosphates, you know, old school soda phosphates which uh, I might get into at some point too. But Ben says, I think I have my first one in Pennsylvania. So there you go, in the tri-state area, the good old egg cream. It's five o'clock, why not have a drink with me? Cheers everyone, have a great Thursday night, and TGIF tomorrow.